Right, once again, my pleasure on behalf of the steering committee to welcome you to the maiden edition of the Jacksonites Professional Development Series Seminar. It's my pleasure to have nominated uh, to as moderator for uh, of the speaker uh, it all promises to be a very exciting experience the time delimited for the proceedings is two hours so for those of us who are in nigeria we're starting at uh, 3 p.m and so wherever you're joining us from around the world can take a look at your time hours we should be done and we hope to maximize our time the various items that have been scheduled uh, for today's uh, proceedings. The Jacksonites, uh, for those who are not familiar with that expression, refer to the alumni of, of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of Nigeria. Now, as you know, they also refer to themselves as Jacks, but this body is principally constituted by alumni of the department. It's the first department of mass communication established in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And for nearly 60 years, it has produced hundreds of professionals in diverse fields of mass communication, journalism, broadcasting, advertising, and public relations, and of course, in the academia. Some of them, of course, will be participating uh, in today's uh, proceedings. The whole idea about the uh, professional development series will be uh, spoken to uh, when uh, we bring in the chair of the study committee to deliver uh, welcome remarks. But certainly for today, on an NPO media in nation. Some would say you couldn't have a uh, choice of the speaker for the year. Uh, we all know what is happening in our country. Uh, two or three Nigerians are gathered today. One of the key issues that they will be talking about is the insecurity in the country. But what essentially is the role of the media and how does the capture of the media act on our insecurity or how can we we uh, ensure that the media gets around this capture and also ensures that the country becomes such the whole idea of media capture. The speaker will tell us, but basically, we do know that media capture is an impediment to media freedom. So, again, to welcome you to the um, media edition of the Just Professional Development uh, Series. We are having a number of participants um, at uh, this uh, in addition. I'm just going through the uh, participants. I go can see if you permit me, uh, Charles Okibo, and I would say that is our own Professor Charles Okibo. Uh, Professor Charles Okibo, if, let me just go through the uh, mediator videos you can see him uh, and so i recognize him much more clearly okay well the video is the miniature window is uh, blank but certainly uh professor charles okibo when he done on we will see him uh, uh, he was uh, one of our lectures in the mass communication department in the 80s and on in the 90s Register of the Advertising Professionals Council of Nigeria. That's the regulatory agency for the advertising profession in the country. It's currently in the United States. They make uh, activity. So I also uh, understood that uh, we have uh, Garba Shehu. Garba Shehu, if I can uh, take him out right now. Let me just try to scroll down on, uh, on, uh, on this. All right, yes, I can see him there. His uh, video is on. Uh, Malam Garabashir, who is, of course, the senior special assistant 
assistant to the president on media and publicity. Uh, Gaba Show and alumnus Jackson is the name of the building that already housed the Department of Mass Communication. At, uh, Jackson, of course, is the name also of one of the early pioneers of the practice of journalism. John P. Jackson that published the Lagos Weekly Record. Now, the Weekly Record was also the name of the practice journal. We published it weekly uh, when we were students. So, I will often to them. I am also tonight. So, very different gentlemen, we have it. Very uh, session. Uh, our keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Tiono, and uh, I have the assurance of, of, of the paper. And there, of course, we have a number of announcements uh, to make with regard to how we will proceed. So let's now uh, invite the uh, team to deliver. Uh, opening uh, remarks. But just before uh, she does, let me indicate that uh, Professor Chinedu Mba, who, uh, he, who is uh, the chair of, of the Cherry Committee, has brought to bear in the current assessment her passion for teaching. And she's a Jacksonite, so the class of 1987, and is an experienced college professor, currently teaches. Uh, and the English for Arcade Purposes program of Agon Queen College in Ottawa, Canada, as well as uh, being the coordinator of, of the domestic stream of the program. Chile Dumba has over 20 years of demonstrated experience in developmental education, program development and management, student success and retention, strategic enrollment management, academic planning, academic advising and academic coaching. And located in Canada nearly two decades ago. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Tine Dumba, Chair of the Steering Committee, the Jacksonized Professional Development Series to deliver uh, welcome remarks. Good morning from Good morning. here in Ottawa. It's a, a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the State Committee to welcome you to this really, uh, a, to say, a location of World Jacksonites Professional Series. Sam. I was going to tell you a bit about the Jacksonites, but thank you so much, Kingsley, for doing such a job uh, explaining where our name comes from. So today's event is uh, a proof for me, a proof of what a group of committed volunteers, in this case Jacksonites, can do. We've come together from across the globe to achieve something that's based on a shared vision and a shared vision. And you're going to do this proof of a commitment to the advancement of professional You'll know globally in recent as profits impacting positively the economy of different host nations. And it is this same spirit that we bring to bear today, and it underscores what we're going to do in here today. So as we consistently set as Jacksonites to promote the personal and professional development of Jacksonites, professional students in communication, and allied sectors. We hope that these are seminar series which will happen quarterly and in which we will collaborate with practitioners in the field and bring to bear the town and the gown will facilitate continuous in the profession. Sessions include professionals from across the sectors like I had already hinted. Or in an insecure, the first step at meeting the vision and mission of the series. I therefore invite you to join us as we examine the current state of the Nigerian media and to join us to explore options available to citizens and practitioners. This is on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, 
is very topical. It is timely. The speaker is very qualified and our moderator is world class. And so dear distinguished participants, on behalf of the committee, the work is you to share your comments and your questions using the hashtag Jacksonites PD series, Jacksonites development series. Thank you so much. Welcome and be part of the conversation. Professor Optino, thank you very much there for uh, your very kind words. And um, just uh, to indicate that uh, amongst our participants today, uh, I've seen uh, two uh, others. You permit me. Uh, for singling out uh, some of uh, the persons for recognition. I will be a make a I saw him a while ago. If you take a look at your thumbnail, you will see, let's go right there. Obi be a Yeah, I thought I saw him a while ago. Uh, let's just disappear yes, again. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. All right. Obi be a is a Jacksonite class of 1982. Uh, for many years, he worked with the music of Nigeria uh, in Lagos, that's Nigeria, and then was posted uh, to New York where he was for many years, and thereafter he became an international civil servant. I think he should be somewhere in Cairo now, or some other location. Obi I'd like uh, to have you join us for uh, this uh, series. I also saw that uh, Ugo Onoha. Ugo Onoha is Jacksonite class of 85. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. He was editor of the Champion newspaper which he also had the privilege of um, chairing, or rather of managing director of, of its board. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, other participants that will recognize as uh, we proceed. So it's time for us to uh, get into the uh, subject matter proper. And uh, this is well within the time that uh, we have dedicated for all of this. Um, Ad Pican has been very carefully selected by very hard-working uh, members of the steering committee. He is uh, Dr. Unduka Otiono. Uh, Dr. Unduka Otiono is an associate professor of African Studies and English and also the graduate program supervisor at the Institute of African Studies Carleton University in Ottawa, also in Canada. He is the author and co-editor of several books on creative writing and academic research. And prior to turning to academia, he was for many years a journalist in Nigeria. Dr. Unduka Otiono has a number of professional honors, including a bounty the Capital Educators uh, Award for Excellence in University Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, LA Career Award for Research Excellence. It's also been a recipient of the Carnegie Africa and the Black History Ottawa Community Builder Award. Dr. Tiono is the principal investigator for Elizabeth II Advanced Scholars West Africa Grant and Vice President Canadian Association of African Studies. He has a number of publications the latest of which will be released, I understand, in October this year. Professor Unduka Otiono brings with him experience in the academia, experience in the arts, and experience in journalism stretching well over 15 years in Nigeria before he again, like uh, Professor Tine Dumba, relocated to Canada. Very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our keynote speaker for the very first in the professional development series of the Jacksonites. You know, we all know how difficult it is to put together an event like this. So I want to thank the organizers, the Jacksonites Worldwide and the Special Steering Committee. 
for giving me the distinctive honor of uh, flagging of this series. And when uh, the chair of the steering committee contacted me uh, um, to actually having to um, be the keynote speaker for this event, I had to mule over what the topic would be. And I want to say that in choosing the title for today's work uh, presentation, a captured media in an insecure nation, democracy, hate speech, and free speech on free on, on trial. That's a question mark there. I entered into a whole lot of reflections on what would be the most opposite uh, topic for today. Amongst others that I considered was um, this topic that I you know, be brewing over for quite a while. And it was entitled Tongues of Hate Speech, Fake News, Rumors, and Digital Democracy in Nigeria. In mentioning this other alternative title, I am at once drawing our attention to what I'll try to do today within the time allotted to me. I'm going to be combining storytelling. As some of you know, I'm a writer and, uh, and I love telling stories as a journalist and also having published a collection of short stories. Some of the stories which you may be familiar with. But I am bringing them up again in the context of my discourse of the topic, which I consider um, very critical, very essential to Nigerian survival at this time. And so um, I will be discussing this you know, in both um, a scholarly fashion, a journalistic fashion, so there'll be some journalists in it. And I just try to reflect the entire mood of the project of the Jacksonites with this series. And in the beginning, I would like to quickly share um, my slide. I was speaking to this slide. I'll just be showing them as a way of visual pointers to some of the uh, subtopics I'll be discussing. So if I may, um, I'll just flip through it very quickly as part of my preamble to give you a sense of some of the areas I'll be covering. And then as I proceed, you begin to see the relationship between these slides set, particularly images, and the sub areas that I'll be discussing. So I hope I have a sharing permission to do this. And so I don't know what you are seeing at the moment. Um, so this is my slide. This is the this is the main the main plan, and then with it. With a caption, a caption, and it's very important that we pay close attention to these inverted commas uh, because it draws a question and that at once tries to deconstruct the idea of captured. That, as a matter of disclaimer, this conversation is not saying the media has been captured. And then it is the question mark at the bottom: democracy and free speech on trial. You know that also shows that these are particular reflections. And so I'll quickly take you on a tour of the slides, there are about five, five slides. And then I'll, of course, this you are already familiar with, which is my affiliation. I should have added my email address, you want to reach me afterwards. And then I'd like to draw our attention to this that we'll have to pay close attention to. The right to freedom of expression is guaranteed and protected in section 39 of the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria in the following terms, every person, and I think some of you are familiar with this, I am very trying to lay the context of some of the key ideas that I was speaking to. And here we have it, you know, more clearly stated, excuse me. Every person shall be entitled to freedom of expression, including freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart ideas and information without interference. And then it goes on to provide this other part. And it is not only uh, the Nigerian constitution, it is also enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and Article 9 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. We have to keep this at the back of our mind. That all of these charters pay close attention to the necessity and the centrality of freedom of expression. And I have online it yet right to freedom of expression. It's a right. It's not a privilege. And if we move further, I'll just lay out again why fake news is so central, because fake news has played a key role in some of the contemporary responses to repress 
uh, freedom of expression. And then the corollary to it is hate speech, which also has played a key role to the extent that the National Assembly in Nigeria has tried to promulgate laws to deal with this. So I have this very fascinating definition of fake news, or at least explication of what we mean by fake news. Although fake news is widely understood to refer to fabricated accounts that are meant to spread virally, the meaning of the term is often misused to refer to erroneous news, propaganda, satire, and even facts with which someone disagrees. So there is a landmine in that, so that that with which someone disagrees. And we know once we enter into the realm of disagreement, we enter into the subjective realm. So it means that the idea of fake news is not even totally sub um, objective. So misleading or out of context information does not constitute fake news if it is not wholly fabricated or if it is included within a news report that reports factual events. And I've taken this from an article by Sheldon um, Boston. And then a few more images, just so that we can concretize what we're dealing with um, in our mind about how the media and why the media should be captured and also why the media should resist being captured and the context in which we are operating. So I have these images, how to avoid fake news. These are some things that images I picked up on the. And then I want to keep this at the back of your mind as well. NSAS movement from Twitter to Nigerian streets. And then there's a subheading here. This is three, and then this was released by Amnesty International. There's a subheading here. This Soros Stoke generation won't give up. I am sure some of you are familiar with the idea of Soros Stoke. Um, I won't get into all the details of this, but I wanted to bring this up as a way of flagging them so we can keep that at the back of our mind while I make the rest of my presentation. And then in this context of the hashtag revolution, or the importance of Twitter, which has occupied even more important role in our country in more recent weeks, is the attention to three people who I, I think, four people actually, who represent different tendencies that the media has had to deal with, and that's going to define national politics. And this is the role being played by Omoleye Shawari, convener of Hashtag Revolution Now Movement, and publisher of Sahara Reporters, one of the premier and substantial online newspapers that's published from the diaspora. And then I like to look at this, the idea of restructuring and nation state agitations and the centrality of these two key figures. On my left is, on the left of the screen, is Nnamdi Kano, with this extremely symbolic and now internationally recognizable symbol, the rising yellow sun. And then on, my, on the right here is the guy who has been arrowed, who was recently arrested in Sunday Iboho. And finally, as this image, and this is not comprehensive, is this fascinating guy who has just uh, won a major break with regards to freedom and the kind of ideas that he has represented. Because, you know, we enter the realm of, uh, of repression, we're also dealing with the battle of ideas. So there are ideologies that are battling for expression through different channels, traditional media and you know, uh, the so-called new media that includes social media and so many other interspaces of media layers uh, through which information is being circulated and recirculated and shared, including WhatsApp and all of those other channels. And of course, we know Sheikh Zakzaki. And then I would end, you know, by drawing attention finally to this very interesting image. If you look at this image, you're going to easily tell the age of the citizens of Nigeria. This is a Nigerian youth. And I have pulled this up, I think, from um, a new story in Quads, you know, one of my favorite uh, um, uh, publications on African affairs. And you have the Nigerians are bracing for another government attempt to regulate social media after national protests. And I'm sure you will make this connection with the answers. So beyond this, um, sorry, just a moment. So beyond in this quick sketch of what I have, I'll be doing, and I'm going to now uh, draw attention and focus a bit more on what I have um, you know, explored in a more schematic uh, format. 
At the dawn of the year 2000, also known as Y2K, in popular parlance, a term associated with the millennium bug, with the millennium bug anxiety at the turn of the last century, many Nigerians optimistically look forward to a progressive new age. The drivers of the optimism were the promises of the new democratic fourth republic, inaugurated on May 29, 1999, as well as the developmental potentials of globalization, modernity, and digital democracy. Beyond the myths linked with Y2K, which included the imagined crash of computers, the imagined crash of computers due to what was called the millennium bug, many felt that the end of military dictatorship would usher in exponential social economic growth in the country. The excitement of democratic rule and the rapid advancement in ICT with the invention of the BlackBerry, and we all remember that almighty BlackBerry, soon reflected in the liberalization of the media and the concomitant rise of independent online media with its challenges to traditional media hegemony. 25 years and seven presidents into the new millennium, all those promises seem to have faded like fake genes. Nigeria, under the rule of President Muhammadu Buhari, is currently teetering on the brink of state failure. And I'm sure this is an idea that many people find very contentious. Is Nigeria teetering on the brink of state failure, or is Nigeria already a failed state? As a matter of our discourses on this topic are beginning to emerge you know, uh, in different areas of scholarship, and it's being theorized and argued. The media appears captured in an insecure country where Boko Haram terrorists and headers preside with impunity. This address seeks to examine this context under which democracy and free speech are on trial and life support in Nigeria. I also intend to address the following research questions. How have orality and social media impacted contemporary digital democracy in Nigeria? Note that I'm using the word digital democracy advisedly because we have had you know, a whole lot of um, campaigns and um, agitations and elections. More recently, we're talking about you know, transmitting the controversy around the decision whether to transmit electronically uh, results of elections. So that is why I'm paying attention to the idea of digital democracy, and I'm using it advisedly. In what ways have the media, especially social media, perpetrated hate speech and fake news in Nigeria? Who are the purveyors of hate speech, fake news, and outright incendiary rumors? What is the role of government in the emerging millennial political culture besides the current attempts to gag or capture the press? And so I'm going to enter into these uh, further discussions uh, by clarifying a bit more what I mean by fake news and hate speech. Fake news and hate speech have become the unholy binary forces that underpin social political communication in what is now hyperbolically known as the post truth or post-factish, some people call it post-factual or disinformation age of the 21st century. So ubiquitous have the twin demons of everyday communication in the streets, traditional and new media become, that in 2016, Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth as its 2016 International Word of the Year. As Barbara Bierseka rightly observes concerning, and I quote, the terminological state of our collective situation. Today, we do not suffer a shortfall of truth. Quite on the contrary, we are witnesses to its excesses, enabled by a circuitous slippage between facts or alternative facts, knowledge, opinion, belief, and truth. Indeed, few to none today openly profess a brazen and callous disregard of truth. Instead, truth tell us all, end of quote. Associated with the emergence of Donald Trump as president of the United States and the rise of populism in parts of the world, these three keywords, fake news and hate speech and post-truth have gained increasing currency in other parts of the world, including Nigeria, where as part of government's effort to deal with what I describe as the Aproco press, or free press, with all pun intended, the state indefinitely banned Twitter from operating in Nigeria on June 5, 2021. That was, as already documented, and I'm sure some of you might be surprised, 
in a quick Wikipedia entry, after the social media platform deleted tweets made by the Nigerian president, Muhammadu Buhari, warning the southeastern people of Nigeria, end of quote. Although not altogether new, these keywords, fake news, hate speech, and post-truth have their antecedents in the past dating back to Plato's Republic, where discourse on truth and falsehood occupies a central position in his discussion of the philosopher king. But it has resurfaced and ingrained itself as part of the contemporary political culture. Beyond the dominance of the United States of America, under President Trump, in discourses of fake news and hate speech in our time, Nigeria has also featured prominently as well under the current regime. Indeed, many would argue that although rumor mongering and war against the local press has long been part of Nigeria's political and communication culture, they have worsened under the current dispensation, reminding us of the savage attack on freedom of expression and civil liberties under Decree 4 in the 1980s. To illustrate, let us examine one advertising aspect of the electoral campaign that ushered in then candidate Muhammad Buhari of the All Progressive Congress, and during which a popular media scholar and columnist, Farouk A. Baragi, identified as part of the top 10 words that trended in Nigerian English in 1916, the two prominent terms that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and some of you actually belong in any of the camps. And the two terms are whalers and hailers. Perogi recognizes, and I quote, several informal groups that go by the name such as Whalers Association of Nigeria, Association of Whalers for a Fair Nigeria and Governance, the Whaling Whalers Association of Nigeria, etc. End of quote. As well as another group called Hailers, so called because of what Perogi identifies as its rhyming quality with and semantic contrast to Whaler. The latter group, according to Perogi, represents Buhari partisans, and I quote him again, in whose sight Buhari can do no wrong, end of quote. And this was published in Daily Trust of 31st December 2016. Now back to the advertising story. One of the most infamous hate speech adverts placed in Nigerian newspapers was on account of politics. It appeared in at least three national newspapers, The Guardian, Punch, The Sun, and I think, if I remember very clearly, also an online issue by leading online issues by, uh, premium times smack on the cover of these three newspapers and it was monday january 19 2015 just on the cusp of a presidential election that was to hold on saturday march 23 the same year the advert in question targeted the presidential candidate of all progressive congress Mohamed buhari who was contesting against the incumbent then good luck jonathan or the people's democratic party a member of president or the president of president's party and governor of the state at the time, Ayodele Fayoshe, sponsored the advert aiming to canvass for Jonathan and conversely narrow Buhari's chances of success in the polls. Nigerians across party divide went uh, about that mid-January morning after seeing the ads staring at them from the cover of the newspapers. And what was this advert about? Some of you might recall. Against the backdrop of the big Zuma rock in the federal capital territory, Abuja, Buhari's photograph is shown alongside two military heads of state and the civilian president, all of them deceased. There is a question mark on the APC candidate's face, with a rider on top cautioning the Nigerian electorate to choose wisely between the incumbent and a presumably ailing presidential candidate who may likely not complete his term in office if elected. Of course, the former head of state while in office, Jeremy Mutala Mohammed, was assassinated on February 13, 1976, after a school attempt. Jeremy Abacha died in June 1998, while Umaru Musaya died in May 2011. It didn't help that all of them are from northern Nigeria. Fire himself is Yoruba from the southwestern part of the country. Will you allow history to repeat itself? Enough is enough for state burials, end of quote.
Peshed declared in the publication, Biblical Prophets, warning his countrymen and women of the imminent doom if they elected Bukhari as president. If ever there is anything like hate speech taken to extremes, this was it in the form of death wish for a presidential candidate. In any case, and as a writer, as an aside, Donald Trump would in 2020 presidential election in the United States haul in windows about the age and health of his opponent, Mr. Joe Biden, who he derisively called Sleepy Joe. You needn't be a highbrow intellectual to understand the message. The impact of the ad hit you almost with the force of an unexpected punch to a solar plexus from a heavyweight boxer. Never in the history of Nigeria, especially during elections, has something like that appeared in print media, certainly not in the front pages of widely read newspapers. The ad itself created such a scandal after it appeared that Nigerians reacted correspondingly because of its vitriolic message. And in fact, some newspapers went ahead to try to explain why they did that. And I think there was a general agreement that it was in bad taste. But somehow the media have been implicated in this. And this also would have consequences into the responses to the media and why it might have been part of the agenda to capture or to cage the press. In summary, Fayoshe wished one of the party's presidential flag bearers dead by making allusions to former heads of state who died as sitting rulers. It was in such a bad taste that even Fayoshe's PDP members dissociated themselves from the advert, insisting that the governor was on his own and had gone ahead with his crude campaign without consulting any of them. If the party members were not private to Farish's unconscionable behavior. They certainly know a thing or two about what fake news is. At about the same time, they spread a rumor that the same Buhari had an operation for prostate cancer at Amadubelo University, um, Zaria, in Kaduna State. Of course, it was not true because the authorities in the school denied having Buhari as a patient ever. They provided documents to back up their claim. And this message had been passed through the press. The most shocking instance of fake news about a Nigerian public figure went viral on the social media barely three months before Fayoshe's advert in January 2019. The individual behind it was another prominent Nigerian, Nandekan, leader of the Indigenous Peoples um, of Biafra, IPOB. Posted on a Twitter account of November 25, 2018, Kano claimed that a Nigerian president who before then had been on a three month medical leave in London was actually a lookalike. At times to his post, we had two images of Buhari signing the document. The first showed the president using his right hand in one and his left in the other. And then there's a, a statement there. Here we have a supposed old man between 76 and 85 years that suddenly switched his right hand from left to right. The IPOB leader declared to Nigerians and by extension the rest of the world, quote, we are waiting for answers, end of quote. He went on, and I believe that millions of people observe, uh, deserve an explanation, end of quote. In reality, Mr. Buhari did not and never had to use any doppelganger before and after he was elected to office as president, first in 2015 and then 2019. If any switch had been made at all, it was a purveyor of the post, Kano himself, by reversing one of the photographs showing the president using his left hand, astonishing for someone who always used his right hand from birth to sign the document. Kano's intention was to show that the president was not the real one, but his double, and even got a name, Jibril, from Sudan. After the video went viral, Buhari himself reacted to the post while meeting a number of Nigerians in Poland, where he was attending a UN conference on climate change. And he was to defend himself by saying, you know, in a humorous way, a lot of people hoped that I died during my ill health. He told the Nigerian committee in Poland at the time, insisting that well, some even reached out to the vice president to consider them to be his deputy because they assumed I was dead, end of quote. And we know that the politics of the illness and death of the president is not limited to Buhari. They had been his predecessors before him. And we know the politics around the death of, say, um, General Abacha and um, President uh, Yaradua. Fake news and hate speech in Nigeria are like five and six. They almost always go hand in hand and almost always with the same intention to damage, impugn someone's character for a stated objective through deliberate disinformation. 
Franz Femi Ojode writes in an essay titled Death of a Myth, Critical Essays on Nigeria, published in July 1999, and I quote, fake news is a fictitious report relating to current events is fabricated and often titled misleadingly with the deliberate purpose of deceiving users and motivating them to disseminate the report. The principal statements of facts are fabricated and untrue. Fake news is presently false and is created and presented in a way meant to deceive consumers into thinking that it is real. Deliberate and deceptive falsity is at the heart of fake news. Around the 1990s, long before social media became popular media of communication in Nigeria, fake news was basically part of the social political life in the country. Memorably, it was reported mostly by word of mouth that the venerable politician and ceremonial president of the First Republic, Nandi Azikiwe, had died. Again, it was untrue because the man himself lived to a ripe old age when he died in May 1996 at 91. Nor is Zik only famous Nigerian to have been killed by word of mouth before his time. Nobel laureate Wolosheyenka is another. For him, he has read about his demise in the social media several times, and each time he laughed it off. He was also laughed off. He supposes he has also laughed off his supposed third class grade from University College Ibadan. Now University of Ibadan, where he studied for the first two years as an undergraduate before proceeding to Leeds to complete his degree program. So we are familiar with the different kinds of what I call street stories, and which was the subject of my PhD dissertation. Although not quite a novel phenomenon in Nigeria, hate speech and fake news have been widely aided by the social media where at the touch of a button, you can disseminate whatever tribe you wish to send to millions of people with access to the internet at just about the same time. In a seminar study of hate speech in Nigeria published in 2018 by the Brookings Institution entitled, Should the Law Be Used to Cop Hate Speech in Nigeria? And the title of this work is significant because we are dealing with the idea of a possibly or a potentially captured press, an already captured press. And here is a central question. Should the law be used to curb hate speech in Nigeria? Adi Bejidofo, the author, noted that, quote, offensive and hateful speech has been a challenge in Nigeria, not only in Nigeria, I think in most parts of the world. It has to do with the Nigerian civil war. Igbo nationalists take offense with the rest of the country. It is about Boko Haram and is our alleged sponsors. So there are different ethnic approaches to understanding and the responses to this. There is no question about the tragedy, about the genocide of the tans become, you know, like an albatross on the neck of Nigeria as a nation and why it's never going to go away. Because with about 3 million people, I come from Ogwashiku in Delta State. And I, I know some families in my, in, my, in my hometown where almost all the male children were wiped out. And then, of course, more recently, the Asaba massacres have begun to make its way into contemporary discourses of the war. And then we also think in terms of Boko Haram and its alleged sponsors, self-appointed defenders of the North are up in arms with equally appoint, uh, appointed defenders of the South. It is, has to do with resource control and oil politics. The North cries off against the South. The Igbos and Yoruba rival ethnic groups frequently pick on each other. This is the way Jidofo frames this. Um, and then end of quote. There was no clearer example or instance of reviving ethnic resentments than during the governorship election in Lagos State in 2015. In a meeting with with Igbo leaders in the littoral states and Nigerian commercial capital. Obari Wan Akiolo of Lagos declared rather imperiously that Igbos in the state should vote for his anointed candidate, Akin Umi Abode of APC, contesting against Jimmy Abode of the PDP. In his somewhat unroyal declaration, the monarch was quoted as saying, quote, if any one of you goes against Abode, who I picked, that is the end of you. If any of you, I swear in the name of God, sorry, I'm not the one swearing, please. <laughs> Goes against my wish that Ambode will be the next governor of Lagos State. The person is going to die inside the world. Continuing, Akil said, if you do what I want, Lagos will continue to be prosperous for you. If you go against my wish, you will perish in the water. And this was addressed to the Igbos. The water the royal father referred to was the Lagos Lagoon, a jogging distance from his palace in Idugaran in mainland Lagos. 
Not only real fathers indulge in hate speech, entire sections of Nigerians do so now and then, especially in a heterogeneous country like Nigeria. In June 2017, through what they call Kaduna Declaration, used in the North gave Ndibo residents there three months to live. The quit order they, con they contended was in response to some inflammatory remarks about the northern part of the country allegedly made by um, Kano of IPOB. Any keen watch out political scene in Nigeria then will instantly recognize that the country was in a low boil and possibly still is. There were no physical showdowns of confrontation between the rival parties, but it was evident that barring any intervention, the country could descend into another fascist war after the civil war that almost dismembered it from 1967 to 70. And the battle royale properly was in the media with different groups trying to present their own side of the story and their own perspective and their understanding of what was perceived as inter-ethnic uh, conflict. Historians often say no country in the world has ever survived two civil wars and lived to remain the same. Last, in April, perhaps because of the chaos that could erupt, senior citizens from across the country convened a meeting to intervene in the matter. Top on the list of the agenda was hate speech. And this has continued also to occupy many of us um, in terms of in discussions about the media and the country. Conveners of the meeting include the clergy, public servants included, politicians and civil society activists. As reported in Vanga News of April 6, 2018 by Omeza Ajayi in the article titled Hate Speech, Nigeria Drifting Towards Anarchy. The elder statesman expressed concern over what they described as a nation's gradual descent into fear, actually, fearing that if the trend was not halted, it could spell doom for the nation and its electoral process, end of quote. Prominent members of the meeting included the Catholic Archbishop of Abuja, John Cardinal Onayekon, former um, INEC chairman, Professor Tahiru Jega, former Igbo leader, Dr. Chukwemeka Ezif, and, uh, Eze, and um, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, who now, you know, one time permanent representative of the United Nations, who interestingly is the chief of staff uh, to the president at this time. And then there were also others, you know, prominent people in the list. In Ajayi's report, the elder statesmen and women claim that the quote, the elites have conspired to institutionalize the culture of hate in Nigeria, and so we must get them to de escalate. The okay. meeting was convened in Abuja, capital of Nigeria, with a motto Center of Unity, and so important, and organized by the Center for Democracy and Development, Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, West African. Uh, network for peace and working group on peace building and good governance. So there is no paucity of Nigerians who are committed to peace building and then also to a free flow of of, uh, of speech within responsible limits. At the time the other statesmen and women met, the general elections were less than a year. With their criminal exchanges between contending political parties and politicians contesting for office, there was genuine apprehension that a court of unity, if ever there was one binding the country, could just snap any moment. Thus, early warning to those involved in the hate speech and the political elite, and then also using the media uh, for spreading this um, information or disinformation. The current tension in the country is being further inflamed by hate and dangerous speeches in Nigerian conversational space. The conveners wrote at the end of their deliberation, and then they continued. The social media is suffused with hateful content that is threatening to throw the country further into the ugly of ongoing violence. Hate speech is not limited to social media. It is openly broadcast on radio and TV programs and limited to a limited extent in newspapers. But even more so, I would add, in the online media. Part of the reason for the current crisis facing Nigeria, they noted, was, quote, the erosion of public trust a toxic atmosphere that was developed in which different actors are suspected of developing plots to destroy others. This is very central. A toxic atmosphere. And they're talking about the erosion of trust and even more so of public trust, where the purveyors and representatives of the state are not to be trusted for the information that they give out. 
and then where also individuals are suspicious of one another along ethnic lines or ideological lines that they also see the media space as a battle space. Preventing willful destruction of lives and property may have prompted a National Peace Committee to invite President Buhari and Atiku Abubakar to a peace accord witnessed by at least two former heads of state. This is how concerned they were about the potential of the country slipping into anarchy. And then the heads of state, uh, former heads of state, the Commonwealth Secretary General, Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, representatives of the UN, the EU, and ECOWAS. Coincidentally, the peace meeting held on Lover's Day, February 14, Valentine's Day, 2019, in Abuja, midwifed by Abdulsan Abuaka. And it was just seven days to the presidential election on Saturday, February 23, 2019. In essence, the presidential candidates of APC and PDP were brought together to promise that they would abide by the outcome of the election. During the meeting, Buhari pledged that, quote, we, the presidential candidates, are here to sign and commit ourselves to do all that is possible to ensure the success of the elections, but most importantly, to accept the final outcome. As for Atiku and uh, echoing Jonathan's now immortal statement considering defeat to Buhari four years before, Atiku said that his, quote, his ambition is not worth the blood of any Nigerian, end of quote. But beyond such personal pledges, what has been the major government interventions in matters of hate speech resulting in electoral violence or raising ethnic tensions in Nigeria? This is the key question that I will just you know, focus on the second part and the finishing part of my presentation. And this subsection is titled, Capturing the Press Through Hate Speech Bill. Given this scenario, this foregoing scenario that we have painted, how do you deal with hate speech are we going to capture hate speech through a hate speech bill a major intervention was introduction of a hate speech bill by senator Ali sabi ablai of apc in the upper legislative chamber in march 2018. Senator Ablahi is a lawmaker representing niger state and part of his recommendation was death death by hanging death by hanging for any hate speech act that causes the death of another person death by hanging hate speech is actually not easy to define because as i said earlier it could be subjective depending on how you are responding to it or whose interests or the ideological divide you represent he also recommended obnoxious fines and jail terms for offenders ranging from at least five years imprisonment to 10 million naira or both so imagine area boys in Lagos being subjected to such a law because they had sent one WhatsApp message that didn't go well, that didn't travel well. As anyone would expect, the bill was dead on arrival because of its opaque nature. What constitutes hate speech? Wouldn't such drastic primitive measures contravening freedom of speech as contained in the 1999 Constitution, Section 39.1, which I had uh, pointed out at the beginning of my presentation, that, and I need to quote this again because it's so central for us to understand that and to ingrain that in our consciousness. And I quote, every person shall be entitled to hold opinions and to receive and impart ideas and information without interference, end of quote. Besides, what is irrelevant of the hate speech bill? Nigerians wondered aloud. First of them was a colleague of Ablahi in the Senate, Shegu Sani, and I'm sure many of you know he's one of our comrades. Though of the same political party as Ablahi, Sani warned that a bill, if passed, quote, will lead to prohibition of free speech, end of quote. And that, quote again, more journalists, bloggers, and government critics will be sent to prison, end of quote. The reason is not hard to see, as Sani opined. Quote, Nigerian political office holders do not want to be criticized, which is why they are not in support of big punishment for so-called hate speech. Sunny's statement criticizing the bill was quoted in an interview granted to Sahara reporters in New York on March 9, 2018. In a skating editorial of the bill, Point newspaper weighed in heavily as soon as it was introduced by Abulai. Under the headline, that outrageous hate bill, published on March 18, 2018, the newspaper averred that though, quote, purveying or inciting hatred is bad, 
But from all perspectives, this is a failure and uncomfortable with the practices and nuances of fundamental rights and democracy. End of quote. Pointedly noting that, quote, the proposed law is amorphous. You know, like an amoeba. You know, if some of you remember that from high school biology, secondary school biology. And open to abuse. It's like it's formless. It has no, you can't even characterize it. And open to abuse. Who defines or determines what constitutes hate speech? End of quote. By proposing the bill, the editorial continued, and I quote again, our lawmakers and public office holders revealed by their utterances that it is criticism and public scrutiny that they deplore, not the protection of minorities. They then nailed the coffin of the proposed bill, finally by calling it, and I quote again, a poison chalice. In sync with the newspaper's views is Jidefo's view in, this, in his article cited above, should a law be used to curb hate speech in Nigeria? Jidefo focuses on the definition of what constitutes hate speech. And I quote him, one of the criticism is that the bill poorly defines hate speech, especially when differentiated between hate speech and abusive language, he writes. And continues, though hurtful offensive speech is believed to be protected, freedom of speech expression to be a protected freedom of speech expression excuse me a critical component of a functioning democracy instead the bill essentially regards even insulting or abusive speeches as hate speech a vague and dangerous categorization end of quote Passing hate speech it continued in a way that delineates it from offensive speech has been a tall task for policymakers and academics around the world End of quote. And I'm just beginning to enter my last stretch. Only last month, on August 7th, to be precise, a very prominent prelate, and this is not just this last um, this in, you know, um, I'm referring to uh, the very prominent prelate of Sokoto Catholic Diocese. Um, His Eminence, Monsignor Matthew Hassan Kuka, had reason to warn Nigerians about inciting hatred with hate speeches. On the country's preoccupation with hate speeches, particularly against the Fulani, he observed at a seminar on fake news and hate speech organized by the Olushegun Obasanjo Center for African Studies. And I was one of the participants and one of the speakers. I was the same panel as him, or with him. Uh, he observed that the blanket and continued hate speeches against the Fulani headsmen as being currently done on social media constitute a threat to the unity and peace of Nigeria, end of quote. The Iran clergy lamented that, quote, the country is on a dangerous precipice, a very dangerous precipice, and therefore called on all the leaders of the country to help bring decision under control and all Nigerians to be their brother's uh, keeper and avoid ethno-religious profiling in dealing with each other. It is impossible to imagine that by themselves, Nigerians indulge in spreading fake news without foreign interference. And this is a fascinating angle to this presentation and also for us to fully understand and characterize uh, the role of media or the place of the media um, in uh, defending democracy and also in serving as a national organ. By now, it is common knowledge that the intelligence community in the United States of America have some niggling doubt about President uh, Donald Trump's disavowal of Russia interference in the presidential election of 2016. Politicians on the left also almost to a man, you know, left almost to a man believe strongly that indeed the Russians influenced the outcome of the contentious poll between Trump and his Democratic opponent, Hillary Clinton. If the Russians can tamper with election proceedings in a country as technologically advanced as the United States, then what about Nigeria and by extension, African countries without such high-tech defenses against electronic snooping and manipulation by other countries? The question was soon to laid to rest when it emerged that for real or allegedly Israel had meddled in elections in Africa, particularly Nigerians in the, that elections, spending humongous amounts of money to achieve their aim. In an article by Yomi Kazim published on May 16, 2019 on Quartz Africa, Facebook shut down a network of fake accounts that targeted African elections from Israel. Kazim wrote, and I quote, while the account's activity focused on audiences across African nations, including Nigeria, 
A Facebook investigation found it originated in Israel. Some of it was linked to Archimedes Group, an Israeli political consultancy that claims to have played significant roles in political and public campaigns, including presidential elections. The network of accounts, the writer revealed, spent over $800,000 on Facebook ads alone from 2012 till this till April. As it has now become clear, fake news groups like Archimedes spread fake news either to sway political opinion or for financial gains. So the question would also arise, and we're going to be moot on this, why is government focusing its fight against fake news largely on its citizens? And then we'll get to that as a way of concluding. Of course, using fake news, hate speech is certainly not novel in local elections or world politics. The most ardent promoter of hate speech was none other than the Führer himself, Adolf Hitler. Convinced that Jews in Germany were the cause of all the problems besetting his fatherland in the 30s, in 1930s, he wasted no time in making his highly educated and civilized compatriots believe that the Jewish question must be settled finally. And we know the consequence. With the exception of few Jews, most went along with Adolf Hitler's final solution to the Jewish question a complicity about a race that had done nothing to harm Germans or their country. And that was the end result of Hitler's hate speech and xenophobia against the Jews. Six million of European Jews dead, gassed in concentration camps, shot, starved, and dehumanized. It lets to say that Hitler left Germany ruined in his wake. More recently, we also witnesses to the kind of xenophobia that has taken place in South Africa, or even to the genocide that happened in Rwanda. Some of this done through radio broadcasts and other forms of information dissemination, underground information dissemination. The questions that emerge from this discourse include that I've been undertaking so far, and I'm going to leave us on that on these reflections on these questions, and hope that it's going to generate further responses. Is. Will such hate speech, now the order of the day, trigger such calamity in Nigerians to Nigerians? Is it possible to capture the media in the context of the pervasive insecurity in the nation? How might we balance the necessity of curbing hate speech while protecting and promoting free speech and the free press and the free press, which are currently on trial and in fact on life support? on that incumbent president in Nigeria. I would like to end by noting that increasing agitations for restructuring of the Federation and concerns over widening insecurity have become the gasoline in flaming mass movements, hate speech, and the repressive assault on fundamental human rights, including free speech as enshrined in various local and universal charter that I had pointed to at the beginning of my presentations. From Omoleye Showeri, convener of Revolution Now Movement, Sunday Igboho Namdekano of IPOB, and other agitators for restructuring and rise of the nation state, depend on the media for their campaign. Will the media be impartial in their role in disseminating information? And is it possible for the media to be impartial, considering the stakes that individual media practitioners have in each of these topics or in each of these ethnic areas or uh, regions of the country? And I'm looking at how the various, I'm interested in, you know, how the various media, from traditional to new media, respond to the unfolding struggle and how this will help in answering the key questions and resolving the central tension in my topic, which is, is the media captured despite the responses of the state and despite its vigorous responses? More recently, we saw the use of VPN, you know, after the ban of Twitter and how uh, young people circumvented this. So is, is it possible? I think the journey is out of the bottle. In a nutshell, if we're gonna give any simplistic answer, and I don't think that answers the question, the media cannot be captured. In spite of globalization, in spite of the insecurities in the country, Nigerian media remains one of the most vigorous in the country, in the, in the world. And a very resilient media, some of the veterans have been uh, guerrilla journalists, 
under some of the most brutal dictatorships witnessed in our continent. And that resilience, and the resilience of the Nigerian people has witnessed through the NSAS riots and the continuing responses and resistance uh, to the different malaise, you know, affecting the country, points to a future uh, that although uh, these spaces may be choked, uh, to use a contemporary Nigerian slogan or slang, they are not definitely going to be arrested. There is no arrest in the media, and the media cannot be captured. The debate and the struggle may just be beginning and entering the next phase. Thank you very much, and I will now welcome questions. Associate Professor Umbuka Okiono uh, has uh, taken us through this by being a storyteller, by being a historian, by being a journalist, and also by being an academic. Uh, Dr. Okiono, we appreciate the presentation that uh, you have made. And uh, this is well within uh, the time that we have delimited uh, for this in the, in, in the program. There will, of course, uh, be time for comments and, and questions. But uh, just before we uh, get into that, let me to respectfully uh, recognize some of uh, the Jacksonites who are uh, participants uh, in this uh, event. Uh, I saw his name a while ago, I, but his video was off. I think it's still there. Uh, Professor Patu Tommy, uh, Professor Patu Tommy is Jackson Knight class of 77 and he's president of Jackson Knights worldwide. And I'm sure that uh, we all know Professor uh, Patu Tommy, uh, renowned uh, public intellectual, uh, professor of uh, political economy, uh, senator from journalism through uh, uh, public service. Uh, and right now is uh, the chair of the Center for Values in Leadership. We also have in the house uh, Dr. Issa Momo, uh, Dr. Issa Momo and Professor Padukome, uh, both of the class of uh, uh, Jacksonites 1977. Uh, Dr. Issa Momo has been a journalist, he's also been an academic. Uh, most recently, he was uh, teaching at the Pan Atlantic University. Uh, in, in Lagos. He had been the editor at some point of uh, the Financial Guardian or the Guardian Financial Weekly. It also been into broadcasting and, uh, and all of that. Dr. Issa Momo, I saw you a while ago. So um, if you can pop up, let me see. Um, not exactly now, but okay. Uh, Dr. Issa Momo, whenever you do pop up, I'm sure uh, the other participants We'll see you. Uh, thank you for being part of this. Very good one. Uh, another, Jacksonite, another senior Jacksonite uh, who is also in the house is uh, uh, Chief Mecca Madwe Buna. Madwe Buna is of the class of 1978. Uh, that's uh, Jackson College. Of course, he was a broadcaster. He was in the Nigerian Television Authority for many years. And uh, he's been uh, also for many decades now uh, into uh, public relations. Uh, he was one of those uh, who uh, headed early on uh, the TCPC, that is the Technical Committee on Privatization and Commercialization. That's the precursor of BPE today. He's chairman currently of Corporate and Financial. So, Emeka Matubura, a pleasure to have you in our midst. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, good. So, we can, we can hear his audio. Uh, so, say hi to us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Good to be here. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. We also have in the house uh, Susan Eschett. Susan Eschett, uh, Jackson of Clients of uh, 86. Uh, very active, of course, in the Jacksonites uh, Forum. Uh, she, apart from also having been in uh, media practice, was in television. Uh, she also worked at uh, Exxon Mobil. Susan Eschett, uh, if you can say hi to us, we'll appreciate that. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. All right. That's great. Good presentation. Uh, thank you. So there are many more names. You will have to pardon me. And I'm sure that uh, we can all go to the, the participants box and just scroll through the links. Earlier, we uh, welcomed Obi and Lekeswe, class of 82. 
Uh, we also welcome Professor Charles Okibo, uh, who taught uh, many of us at uh, the Jackson Building. And then uh, there was also Malan Gabashu, very well known uh, public figure, of course. He, he was uh, an editor uh, and also former president of the Guild of Editors. So we're going to proceed now by uh, taking comments and, and questions. Um, keep them short and sharp so that we can further maximize our time. So we have a question from Dr. Chidebere Machuku, and uh, his first question says, Dr. Otiono, what exactly constitutes hate speech and who defines it? Thank you so much for this question. I, I think this is an inevitable question, you know, in terms of um, what exactly and if you don't mind, I think there's yet another question that is related to that mm -hmm. um, about about um, hate speech. In any case, let me answer this precisely, and we can take on other questions as they come. So, what exactly constitutes hate speech, and who defines it? I thought I addressed this, you know, extensively in my presentation. So, just to take us back to the title of my presentation, you know, which is a captured a captured there yeah, yeah, i modified that presentation because i think i added hate speech to it the only initial title has um, democracy and free speech on trial so i added hate speech so we should just take note of that it captured captured you know um, media in an insecure nation and then the subtitles are democracy hate speech and free speech on trial and in my presentation, I try to make it very clear that the idea of what constitutes hate speech is not easy to define. Because, and then the best way I could define it, and I tried to do, was to demonstrate through what appears as hate speech or hate speeches, you know, examples that can that that defines it. So I use the advert. Um, and I and I, I use this advert to show how, um, despite the fact that there's free speech, there can be borderline between free speech and hate speech because this is a very amorphous, and that's another word that came up, amorphous. But it is amorphous, so it is not something you can very easily describe or or, or define. Instead, I have you know pointed out to the difficulty in defining it but also and then showing how subjective it is and how ideological it could be because what constitutes um free speech for chide berry machuku might be hate speech for ndoka Utiono. and so we enter this realm of a, of, of, of a contest of who's free speech and who's hate speech what is considered as freedom of freedom of expression and they write in your column in an op-ed the state says no you have crossed the ramp that this is bordering on treason. So when an IPOB leader engages in freedom fighting and engages in, in a struggle for his people, another person says, no, this is treason. And then he's arrested. Sunday is arrested. Sunday Bo is arrested. Shore is arrested for revolution now. So who defines who's free speech? and whose hate speech. I'd like to recommend this small book. I'm not paid to recommend it anyway, but I found this book. Okay, maybe you can see it. The title is Hashtag. It's a tiny book published by a prominent Nigerian press, Chimamanda Adichie's uh, publishers. And it's so readable. It talks about Twitterati, it talks about hate speech in very accessible way. And so it, who defines hate speech can be subjective, but I think we can all agree to the limit to which common sense is common. I know that we say that common sense is not common. That a certain kind of speech that is intended in some cases outrightly to destroy an opponent of, well, some people say that anything is fair in war. So again, that even becomes even problematic. However, we do, agree to a very large extent that some of the weapons used during the Nigerian Biafran War crossed the level of acceptability. You know, when hunger is used as a weapon in war and you have children with distended tummies, you know, suffering pashoko, amounting to virtual um, genocide, you will not say that 
uh, speeches meant to promote the victory or that anything is fair. So um, that, in my opinion, is um, how we can look at exactly what constitutes hate speech. It can be relative, depend on who, but we can also have something close to universal standard of definition of what constitutes hate speech. And then we use the example of, um, the, of the advert, you know, placed by Fireshare. I think it was in very bad taste. I don't know how that might be defended as his right in terms of fundamental human rights for freedom of expression um, to have represented that, that, that. Or are there ways in which we must apply certain kinds of laws that will curtail slippage into anarchy and abuse of free speech? I hope that answers the question. Chide Berry. Thank you very much, Dr. Otiana. That was quite a, a good response to his question. We have another question here from uh, Moshud. And Moshud asks, how do the media apply the self-censorship button in the fight against fake or hate news? How do the media, yes. How does the media apply the self-censorship button? Okay, so not all the questions are on this uh, chart, I believe. I'm looking at this. Okay, I'm trying to follow it. Okay, how does the media self-censorship? Well, that again, you know, puts us in a very slippery terrain. Because in as in um in saying that the media has the capacity to apply self-censorship, then it means that the media is also reasonable enough not to cross the lines. As a writer and an artist, censorship is an anathema, you know, to a very large extent, because it is, it, it is very destructive to creativity. And self-censorship can even be the worst. In other words, you have discouraged and disqualified yourself before somebody else had the opportunity to even assess you. This is purely from a personal point of view and in terms of goals that we are pursuing in life. But beyond that, I think that media professionals are trained to be reasonable. They are trained to understand the laws because their laws govern our practice as media people. So when um, you hit that button, you know, when you hit that send or share button on WhatsApp, let's say of an image of Boko Haram slaughtering an entire village. And you are showing this. So you'll see that there are certain decisions you have to make consciously or subconsciously. What is it? We are all invested in one way or the other. So censorship requires a certain degree of consciousness about what constitutes the excess. Because we said, yes, you know, there's free speech and we must all protect freedom of speech. But at the same time, it, you know, it seems that it's important in our own relationships as a people and in the community to recognize that there are excesses. So that judgment, you know, oftentimes may not, that call that is being made by the media practitioner may not always be right. And that is where the controversy gets in. So the sense self-censorship is important to the extent to which uh, the best interest is served by the media story. And very often it is a pro-people, pro-society interest. And then very often it is also designed to protect the masses or to advance the interests of the masses, which is why it becomes problematic, especially in our context, when media practitioners depend on politicians in state houses to release gazettes. And so the media, uh, at those days, uh, Stanley McEvoy, may he so rest in peace, you say that the, the first principle of the true journalist is skepticism, is not to trust whatever information you're being given because you have to wait and you have to interrogate it. And so when we also add the censorship part of it, then it becomes a huge responsibility that we shoulder and one that requires our best judgment or value judgment to decide. Unfortunately, uh, we don't always you know, cross the bar in that decision. Uh, are, there, are there any more? Uh, questions or comments from participants uh, before we say one or two things more. Yes, I, I do. I do have something. Can I come in here? Oh yes, please. Uh, kindly introduce yourself and where possible your affiliation. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Obi Emekekwe. I am uh, exact night of uh, class of eighty two, and um, 
I, well, I, at the moment, I'm actually uh, retired. I used to be the director of communications at the African Export Import Bank. I am now a consultant, you know, do, uh, working on a number of things here and there. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Chiono for a very excellent presentation. Um, I really enjoyed your uh, what you had to say. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. It's probably more of a comment than anything else or, or a question, if you like. But I'm wondering, um, when we talk about fake news, a lot of what people call fake news actually stems from the work of uh, citizen journalists and people on social media. So the reaction that we get actually, you know, is, is actually maybe people trying to react to to those things. But um, so how do you uh, how does the media protect itself from this kind of uh, uh activities because a lot of times it's not the media itself generating the the fake news so to speak it's actually coming out, coming coming in from external sources you know but everything is plumbed together as a media uh, uh activities so how do we how do you protect the media from this kind of uh, situations and a very important question that it, you know it is because um the idea of citizen journalism and professional journalism has continued to um, engage media scholars and practitioners, you know, um, because as I had already indicated in my previous response, I noted that there are professional journalists, the people who are trained and who have the capacity for value judgment as much as possible, who will know if you're in the newsroom and then um, those days you brought a story to um, uh, to editor Kingsley Sadler, it's going to go through in fact, before it would have gone through stages before it gets to your editor. You know, the line editor would have gone through it, and then it goes through in some cases even the sub editor. So it's it's gone through a purification process, a peer review process. That in itself is available in the traditional media. And that guarantees to a very large extent a higher quality of news output or what is published as news. This gatekeeping is non-existent in the new media or the online media, you know, where everybody's a publisher, you know, I could publish. And then these days to everybody is a publisher, even in terms of writing. So if you wrote a book, it's supposed to go through peer review process, you know, and then in many cases, one dreaded aspect of publishing, whether in journalism or in academics or in literature is rejection. You know, I mean, some of us who have been writing and journalists, you know, who pass through this traditional system, know that nothing could be more dampening than a rejection. You just get asked, no matter how polite and very and uh, diplomatic it is, you know what it is. And then those days are the Guardian. You know, when I joined the Guardian in 1991, you went through um, a test period of sometimes up to two years, three years. In fact, it's not; it's indefinite in some cases where you had to have produced a certain quality of story before you are employed. So this is a purification process. All of this gatekeeping has disappeared to a very large extent in contemporary instant publishing, where WhatsApp was forced to reduce your capacity or our capacity to, to share to as many people, in fact, the entire list, you know, to five people because of the dangers inherent in that instant publishing process and so but again there's there's a slippery terrain there where it is difficult to draw to some extent distinction between what you call the professional journalist and you know the citizen journalists because now professional journalists also depend on citizen journalism for reporting and there are outright you know uh, publications that make it possible for you now to submit stories including some of the most revered you know publications in the world instead they create a section where there's citizen and you have instant reports because increasingly people also began to look on these citizen journalists for authentic reports more so in a compromised system where a brown envelope or some journalists you know uh, in the traditional press especially may have become you know um, subject to the powers and to the money of the of the power of the of the of the rulers of the day and then instead they have also turned to the to the new media you know for publishing 
So they're more online. So you see the Guardian, you see Vanguard, all of them now struggling to have instant news reports. And of course, we know the consequences. So I'm very careful in delineating that distinction between the new media and the traditional media, between the professional journalist and the citizen or non-professional journalist. But in all, it is something that we need to pay attention to. But again, I would like to end by saying that we, we also learn to read. We all don't have the same capacity to read. When you read a story, sometimes you don't, you know, some of us are trained to be able to verify that story. You verify the image with Photoshop that is possible to do just about anything, to recreate people and recreate situations. It is possible to have, we used to say that, you know, photograph speaks the truth. But you know that these days, not the photograph, not the video, because there are different kinds of sophisticated editing that can corrupt the image and corrupt the story in order to tell it from a certain, to give it a slant that favors uh, the platform from which it is being published. Thank you. All, all right. Uh, thank you very much Dev, for your response. I see that Malan Garba Shehu has had his hand up uh, for a while now. Malan Garba? Thank you for giving me the privilege to be part of this discussion. And I must say that uh, this is a first class lecture which you have listened to. I, I, I commend it as being, as being competent and well delivered. Uh, of course, I do have a few disagreements. And when that brilliant presentation was laced with a few political statements, which I, I certainly disagree with, and I, I wish to make uh, that point, uh, you know, about those uh, disagreements. But first of all, to say that I totally agree that that a false speech is a problem all over the world, and and it, it has been part of humanity for all the time and we are not going to wish it away. And uh, some of us who are privileged to come close to people who are serving in government, do ring the bell from time to time that uh, don't be too aggressive, you know, in trying to, to, to limit uh, false speech because there's that very thin line between it and an attack on, on, on the freedom of expression from which uh, our lecturer has uh, eloquently uh, defended. However, when harm is being done, uh, something must be done. And, the, and, the, and as we can see this happening in quite a number of countries, European countries, including the UK, you know, promulgating laws and filing, finding these technology companies hugely. When they, when they, when they attack, uh, uh, you know, minority groups, uh, uh, women and the children and, and all of that, and, and so therefore, there is also that person need to see that something is being done in our own country. And he has spoken eloquently about the need for freedom of expression within reasonable limits. Uh, some of us in government find it very difficult to explain to our colleagues in the field that uh, we as practitioners, we ought to start doing something. Let us, let us do it ourselves. Don't allow others to do it for us. I totally agree and I disagree with what happened uh, you know, with, with the Senate bill, which uh, happily had been killed. However, however, the time will get to come when certainly we have to give something. And this is that don't surrender the freedom. I don't support uh, uh, subservient media, but it has to be. In, in saying that I disagree with a few things, when he said, for instance, the Boko Haram, uh, fighters and the hardest preside over with impunity. And that is very political. And I think that anybody who wants, you know, we have Nigerian military and they come from all over the country, irrespective of region or ethnicity. They're also being killed by this Boko Haram terrorists. They're sacrificing their life in order to make you and I uh, safe. I, I don't think that we should pretend as if there is nothing uh, going on uh, about that. Now, uh, this thing about, he said also about uh, focus on citizens. Governments are focusing on citizens. I take that as a valid criticism, and I hope that our administrators will get better and uh, improve on this. Uh, I think that the enemy is the technology company. Uh, Nigerians have uh, reacted uh, in so many ways to the thing about Twitter. He has also spoken uh, about that. But if you see what is happening elsewhere, 
uh, uh, several countries, India, Australia, and so on, something is being done to Google, to WhatsApp, and all of that because limits are being crossed. Let me stop here. And I want to say that I totally agree with this final conclusion. You cannot kill the press. You cannot chain it. You cannot, uh, the, the press in the country is healthy, is vibrant, is aggressive, and will continue to do so. Nobody can stop this. Thank you for the, giving me this opportunity to be part of the conversation. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Malan uh, Gabasheho. Don't, don't just go away yet. I'm sure perhaps there will be some other questions uh, for you to respond. I'd like to respond to that. I just, uh, uh, I, uh, Dr. Tiono, well, you respond, but we have some uh, questions from the chat room so that you take them along. I just want to give you this one. Uh, it's from Dr. Chinedu. Could you assist us by giving us your full names? Uh, that way, you know, you are fully acknowledged. Dr. Chinedu uh, writes, uh, good presentation and quite insightful. My question is, in your opinion, is there a nation in the world where the media can totally prevent being captured? Can the media be independent? You know, that's independent, that's the way you wrote it. Can the media be independent? Perhaps you can say, can the media be ever independent? Well, thanks. You know, thank you, um, Dr. Chinedu, for that uh, question. And um, Malanga Bashe, I, I want to thank you for your intervention and for the points that you made. I'm going to take the two together. Uh, there isn't much of um, a response that I'm going to give to uh, Malan Gabashe, who's um, um, intervention or comments. I think I agree with you to a very large extent of redefining or qualifying the idea of impunity in you know, Boko Haram. There is no question that uh, the government of the day, you know, has made very heroic efforts to contain uh, the activities of these bandits. You know, but one of the um, emerging literature discusses about state failure is the idea of ungoverned spaces, you know, and how much, you know, what kind of effort will constitute an appropriate response, you know, to um, say the, the tragedy, the tragedy that Boko Haram potents or of the headers, the Fulani headers across the country. Um, a more occupying idea has been this so-called Fulani, I mean, so-called because that's the way it's been called, you know, Fulani X-Men. Some people have been talking about the foreignization and so on. I don't know, enter into all of those politics, but politics is inevitable in a discourse like this. And while we recognize uh, the efforts of government, it is important to also demonstrate how much it falls short because um, the insecurity in the country, I think many would have agreed, have, have spiraled to the extent that is certainly troubling in you know, many parts of the country. Um, people wonder what kind of a state do you have on a continuous basis? Hundreds of school children being kidnapped almost on a weekly basis in a governed space. So uh, why we recognize this hero, Iqbal Gabashehu, uh, this is the sense in which the word impunity is being used because um, in a state that is, that is secured uh, by, the, by the machinery of state, the apartheid of this the security apartheid, of the state, you know, some of these things would have been minimized. Um, having said that, I would also um, like to thank you for your your compliments. And then talking about um, where where can the media be independent, ever be independent? It's a very interesting point that we often often overlook that it is called media, not medium. So when we think about it in terms of media, so we are recognizing that different kinds of media, electronic, state-owned. So while you have activists, you also have comprado. You have uh, government media who are also promoting certain perspectives. So the, the media space is a battle of different ideologies and interests. But as a whole, the media is, for me, what we call in Igbo, Ikuku. It's air. You can't, you can't, you can't bottle it in the sense that you're just gonna, you know, you know that you're gonna capture. How do you capture the air? You can trap some air, but the atmosphere is the atmosphere. 
if it were possible to trap air, it would have become a weapon of war, I can assure you. You know, so you just enter one space, like in the car's room, all you need to do is just get into the into the porch, uh, put in one kind of uh, equipment and suck up all the oxygen there, and then the people then suffocate. But there are things they use in, in biological warfare. So can they ever, can it ever be captured? My answer is categorical no. Can it be repressed and suppressed? Yes. And this has happened, Decree 4. They have been death sentenced. The, the obnoxious bill that was being proposed was proposing death sentence. There are police states around the world where just having a pen can cost your life. There are several Nigerian journalists that have been assassinated. I have been shot point blank in Lagos, in Apapa, under very mysterious circumstances that we couldn't determine immediately whether it was armed robbery attack or was it some kind of assassination attempt. So there are many of our colleagues who have gone down in various, and that we don't have to start calling them, from activists to journalists. Many have suffered incarceration and continue to suffer incarceration. But has all of these efforts captured the media? The answer is no. Instead, they don't know, they just keep developing different devices for beating censorship. And there is nowhere in the world, including some of the worst places in the world, where you can't speak negative of the press, including Russia, where you will not have guys who will defy it. Some of them musicians, artists, activists, media practitioners who will do everything possible to get across their stories and to fight the state. So the answer for me is categorical. The media has never been captured and it will never be captured. It will keep undergoing different kinds of metamorphosis to deal with state repression and censorship. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Unduka Otiono. Uh, that last question was from uh, Dr. Tinedu. He's giving us his uh, full name now. Dr. Odwemelam Chinedu Christian. Uh, thank you very much there for your intervention and uh, for the response from our keynote speaker. Uh, I'm going to take one other question and then also pop my own uh, question to our guest uh, uh, speaker. But uh, I see that uh, Professor Patu Thomas' uh, video uh, is, is blank in the meantime. Let me put him on notice. Uh, I'm unlikely to invite him at this time because he will be giving us the closing remarks. Uh, so, Professor Patu Tommy, keep your gunpowder dry. So, uh, giving us the closing remarks, you can, of course, uh, uh, come in with your magisterial intervention. Uh, all right. So, one, of, one other question we have here. This is from Asukwa Solomon. Uh, it is, can we also see a captured media? in terms of government trying to guard the media from reporting news in its factual state, especially in the recent order by the Nigerian government that some aspects of the ongoing violence in the country should not be presented. Uh, it says the recent order by the Nigerian government. We have to make a distinction here. That uh, I'm sure he's referring to the directive from the NBC, that's the National Broadcasting Commission, uh, advising that uh, aspects of insecurity should not be sensationalized and uh, greater care should be taken in discussing uh, insecurity issues in the public space. So once again, uh, Dr. Otiono, it says, uh, can we also see a captured media in terms of government trying to guard the media from reporting news in its factual state? there is this is related to the previous question that i answered you know um there is nowhere in the world that the media does not exercise some kind of restraint and judgment you know the great journalist is one who weighs the benefits of any story before publishing them because you know uh, it's supposed to mass communication it's supposed to serve the interests of the people the interests of the masses in a shrinking world, you know, made possible through technology um, and increasing so by technology. And then now we are seeing also space um, exploitations or explorations, you know, the race, you know, for space and how new technologies are also being developed. 
uh, it seems inevitable that uh, regulations will have to be applied either self-consciously or regulated through different media. So, you know, in, in the, there's a difference between media in the Western world, particularly, and media in Africa, including Nigeria. Whereas media in this part of the world, say in Canada, is often uh, moderated around ideology. So you have conservative values or liberal values. And you have these media organizations whose positions in this matter you define. And so some people, for example, who are liberals may never tune into Fox News. And by civil sir, people who are conservative, you see them hardly tune into MSNBC or even to some extent, you know, um, CNN, because, you know, these ones have more liberal tendencies. That is not the case with our own media space in our country, where we do not have very clearly defined ideology most of the time. However, the kind of ideology we have is progressive. You know, so you have some media houses that you can associate with progressive forces, and then some that you can, you know, um, also associate with reactionary um, forces or leaning. And so, uh, if we put that into consideration, then it becomes moot point whether government can truly regulate, because they are subversive media, and indeed, a whole lot of media in in the world is not subversive. You know, you find people for whom people want to read critique of government. They do not want to read just government gazettes. And I think this is part of what has affected, um, to, in my opinion, the readership of some of the traditional press, because what you see very often is no longer investigative journalism. Because investigative journalism is usually antithetical, usually, not all the time, because media can promote the good work being done by government. But very often, it's held a fifth, a fifth state of the realm, is to hold the state accountable. That's what the responsibility is, to hold the state accountable. So within this kind of uh, situation, there would always be tension between the state and the media. And I mean the alternative media, because we have said that there's some media that actually promote government's um, interests or government policies and government programs. So within that kind of context, I believe that uh, the, the best case scenario is a negotiation in line with what Madam um, Gabashi had suggested about the sense of responsibility of knowing uh, between media houses and also depending on the experience of media managers, the kind of way they want to undertake this holding of uh, this accountability responsibility of the media. And so to recommend uh, what an independent press should do is at best, you know, just a dream. Is they dreaming? You know, that's not to say that they will not take into consideration, but you are not typically going to legislate what Sahara Reporters, for example, is going to publish or what some other media would publish. The same way in the, in the most civilized parts of the world, in Canada, where I, I live, um, the most influential president and, and liked press prime minister, you know, is not going to be able to legislate because the promises themselves, you know, are, are semi-independent, semi you know. It's a state in which uh, you can't legislate, for example, what the people in Quebec are going to do. Uh, sometimes they take open policies that serve the interests of their people, say in terms of oil. The prairie area of Canada, you know, where you have Alberta and so on, they are against any attempts, you know, to kill oil exploration because that is the main state. That's what the economy revolves around. But there are other people who hold a different policy and the state holds a policy at this point in time you know, that's trying to balance this competing interest. So that would always be uh, the situation. There'll be a haggling in terms of media position and in terms of ideologies of the different media houses in relation to uh, prescriptions or recommendations by the state. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Undukau, you know, thank you very much there for your response. We have just under 10 minutes to wrap all of this up. So we're going to try to maximize the time that we have. Uh, I'm wondering, I see both his microphone and his uh, video um, muted, but if Professor Charles Okibo can hear me, uh, it just might be welcoming to we just hear a few words from him. Professor Charles Okibo, are you there? Let's see your video. I see well, your video was on a while ago and it was off. It's, I think it's back on now. Professor Charles Okibo, let's see you, sir. 
Yeah, Kinsley, thank you so much. But you guys have heard my voice for so long that today... Danny, I have not for a long time. <laughs> yeah, today, today I'm just I'm just comfortable listening to you again and seeing how much wisdom you all exhibit. I'm so impressed with how far you all have gone in life, and it pleases me to know and to know that this is just the beginning, and I expect to see more. So this is not I'm not one of the speakers, but I want you to know that I'm behind you in everything you are doing. Thank you so much. Keep the flag flying. There is no other school in Africa like the Jackson School. At the appropriate time, we shall tell the full story. And all of you will be so proud that before Azikiwe established that school, there was no school of journalism anywhere in Africa. And so you should be proud of your, of your history. And thank you so much for giving me this podium. I will always be part of you. It's God's will that I join you and nobody can put us asunder. <laughs> thank you so very much, Professor Charles Okebo, uh, to one of our very uh, revered uh, teachers at uh, Jackson College. Uh, he's gray now in his beard, but he still looks very young. Uh, that's the way he's always looked over the years. <laughs> uh, Prof, you have to give us a secret. Uh, I'm sure that uh, your brother, Professor uh, Pat Otome, is delighted to see you uh, on this uh, platform. I just saw for Twitters at one of the preliminary uh, prep meetings. Uh, we're wondering, say, just, just assume, for instance, that uh, you know, Professor Charles Okubo decided to join us. And here we are today. We have uh, been so delighted uh, to uh, hear your very thoughtful words. All right. Uh, so just a couple of announcements uh, before we get our closing thoughts. Unless uh, there are any other contributions, if any. Uh, it, uh, I, want, I want to pull him out. Uh, uh, Senior Mecca Madwe Buna, are you there? I, I, I believe it's a meta model gonna see the meta model gonna are you still around yes i am yes i, think, I am I, I think that i think that this is one issue that uh we may have to take a look at uh, in future i've uh, had the privilege of uh, anchoring the program uh, of advertisers and advertising practitioners uh, here in abuja a couple of years ago and one of the issues that we raised, Bill Shobanjo was a key speaker on that occasion, it had to do with noise in advertising, particularly television advertising. There's too much noise. Uh, they spoke to that. But one of the points that uh, our keynote speaker raised today had to do with both uh, fake news and hate speech, but particularly hate speech in political advertising. So how do we kill that? There are persons who are in the corporate communications, there are persons who are in political advertising, who are framing these messages and taking them out there. What level of responsibility do they have? Yes, you can say the media provides a platform for airing this, and the media can say, no, but we'll reject this, but there's economic pressure. And then, of course, you have to face the consequences if there's defamation. But what do you do? What is your responsibility as a copywriter? when you are designing a message. Like the fire uh, advert that, that was referenced a while ago in a politically volatile environment, what do you do? I'm sure that it's an issue that uh, we could take a look at sometime because we have a number of good advertising practitioners uh, in our midst. Uh, I wanted the Mecca Madibuna to speak to that, but uh, it's not uh, responding. So the, the uh, announcement is we're going to get is, our closing is, remarks. It is. Uh, is. Sorry. Uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here, yeah, Kingsley. Oh, oh, all right, sir. I'm sure you heard uh, what I was saying. If you could just get uh, a few I, words I, I heard you. I, I heard you. And the, the underpinnings, whether it's copywriting for advertising, developing communications plans in the area of public relations or journalism, are the same. The ethical issues, the responsibility inherent in all of those things, they don't change. And uh, oftentimes it's from the basics. What are the promoters trying to achieve? 
It's like the issue we have in Nigeria, and I can say it now because there's a bunch of elites. Today in Nigeria, uh, Ndoka talks about uh, Namdekano, Ibuhu, and all of that. Check their back. I'm not running any of them down, but check their background. These are people who have emerged because there's a void, and the void is as a result of the fact that the elites like us have not looked beyond our individual colleagues. I'm a journalist, I'm a public relations practitioner, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. I just want to succeed in my calling, hang out with my friends. I don't think about society. It's the same factor that influences what the promoter of that product or services or the politician does. That's the problem. So it doesn't change. My fellow says, uniform, not cloth, not tailor, they make and all of us are the same. So that's what it is all about. So the challenge is there. I'm happy we can talk about this in more detail at some other time, but that's, a, that's an issue that we have. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much there, uh, Chief Emeka, uh, Satellite of uh, the class of 1978. Uh, we're going to have uh, the closing remarks, but uh, I I'm just wondering, uh, before the closing remarks or that, there's supposed to be uh, a poll uh, which the steering committee has designed. Now, the purpose is uh, to elicit uh, responses from participants at this inaugural uh, so that uh, you get a feedback, as it were, and ensure that the next event is a tremendous improvement on, on this very first. And after you have completed the poll, uh, we'll, of course, uh, get to hear what the next uh, just nice professional development series calendar uh, would be like. Uh, Professor Chinedumba, are you ready to launch the poll or do we uh, invite Professor Pat to tell me to uh, give the closing remarks and thereafter we we'll get Dr. Chooks uh, to give the vote of thanks. Uh, yes, I think we'll, uh, we'll allow them speak and then we'll have the poll as the last uh, item on the agenda for today. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much there, uh, Chair of the Steering Committee. It's now my privilege and pleasure to invite the President of uh, Jacksonites uh, Worldwide, Professor Patu Tommy, to give the closing remarks at uh, the Made Jacksonites Professional Development Series Forum. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Kingsley. Um, uh, first, I, I have to, even though there's a vote of thanks, I have to say to Dr. Juno uh, that we really, really appreciate the time he has taken to uh, do a great job of this subject. And also to thank Jackson I who have come out to be part of this in the expectation that this is the um, foundation for greater things to come. Uh, the subject has always fascinated me, um, but if we just think of it from the perspective of the question that was asked, will there ever be a free media? Uh, not because we li live in a relativist world today in which everything is uh, being made relative, but so long ago, by Sibad Peterson and Shram in their four theories of the press, what is freedom is really a function of uh, the context. I, I believe that the Americans who think of freedom of expression, uh, even some of them would have been shocked by what evolved after the Australians moved into their media. Um, I lived in the States in the 70s and early 80s. And um, in those days, there was a fairness doctrine that the FCC uh, had in place. And I used to joke about um, how the media managed that um, fairness doctrine. Uh, after they've said what they want to say, your right of reply is given to you very nicely, but it comes at midnight. 
to those of us who get home at about midnight uh, and have to watch TV after we've been in the library all evening, have to listen to all these right of reply stuff, which those that had the original uh, uh, stories uh, fast asleep, not not. And of course, uh, Reagan had revoked the fairness doctrine. And then Maxwell and who came in, and um, they came in with Fox, uh, what really uh, free speech. I am uh, um, the two, two uh, Harvard professors um, <coughs> who have written a, a nice book about. Uh, is this how democracy ends? Uh, and I watched one of them, I think it was Ziblatt, um, uh, speaking uh, at Yale um, some time ago about the direction of America's democracy. And uh, it looks like we're losing. Uh Professor Pat Utrame, there has been an indication that his bandwidth was low. Uh, Professor Pat Utrame, do we have you back on? Professor Pat Utrame, do we have you back on? Um, let's see, this is one of the challenges uh, that we face in the virtual uh, conferences. But just take a look at the uh, the chat box. Uh, very interesting messages that you have in there. Quite a lot of appreciation. All right. Uh, Professor, I, uh, bandwidth, the bandwidth is low. The bandwidth is low still, uh, so it's slow. As I'm saying, uh, conclude quickly. But your, I was talking, making the point that Ziblatt was trying to make. Culture. The very well, very well, Prof. Do we turn off our videos? Yeah, very well, Prof. Yeah, let's let's hear you. Prof. <coughs> Okay, I think it's uh, some fluctuating bandwidth that uh, uh, Prof has there. Uh, I don't know how we're going to handle this because after the vote of thanks, we launch into the poll. Uh, you want to do the poll uh, and see if it comes back? Well, I'm just wondering. It, it doesn't. Okay, we it, can it, we it, can it, launch the poll. <clears throat> All right, so Prof Chair, don't, don't launch the poll. Just give us. Uh, give participants uh, a guide as to how to proceed with the poll. Uh, let's see how certainly, uh, Prof. Rejoices. Certainly. So it's a, it's a 10 item uh, multiple choice uh, poll. All you have to do is click um, what the, your response is, and uh, you should get through it in about two to three minutes. So I'm going to click uh, on. Uh, oh, wow. The poll is not cooperating with me at this time. So we'll go ahead. I will email you the poll, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, it's not cooperating. So I will email you the poll. Uh, Kingsley, go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Yeah, sorry. I mute, I mute, I muted myself, both the audio and the video. Yeah, uh, so, I'm having you can problems with the poll. Yeah, I'm having it, problems it, with the poll. So we'll go ahead and I will email the survey. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. I, Thank I was you. also going to say that um, we'll proceed with the vote of yeah, thanks. That's good. Because this is one of the challenges uh, one faces from time to time uh, when you're an anchor at a state program. You, you don't usually after the governor speaks or the president's more importantly the president no other person speaks but you are then required 
to invite one of the organizers to give a vote of thanks even before the president has spoken or before the governor has spoken. And you don't know what he's going to say. So the trick is to say for just coming at all, for providing us with the opportunity uh, for the conference or the meeting, we thank you very much, Your Excellency. And then the Excellency delivers his uh, address and then I've to take photographs and then the national anthem. Uh, I don't know, Professor, part of Tommy, I don't know whether you are warming up for 2023. So maybe this might be a rehearsal for you, but uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's appreciate all those uh, who have made this possible. And to do that, we'll be inviting another uh, Jacksonite, Dr. Chooks uh, Odiego Emwaram, has been uh, in, uh, on this uh, program, uh, patiently listening and uh, watching. Dr. Odiego Emwaram is a lecturer in the Department of Mass Communication at the National Open uh, University. He's an alumnus of Jackson, where he had his uh, first degree uh, in mass communication. Subsequently, he had a master's uh, in the same discipline at the University of Lagos and a doctorate in the same discipline at Covenant University in Ottawa, uh, Ogo State. So, Dr. Everham has had a robust, handsome corporate communication and media consulting experience with a number of uh, blue chip organizations within the telecoms, banking, and manufacturing sectors of corporate Nigeria. Uh, his research interests are in the areas of digital media and global uh, interactions, effects of and opportunities in social media and, and peace journalism. Uh, Dr. Chooks, uh, thank you very much. I had the benefit of uh, your uh, handsome uh, activities uh, while you yourself and one of your other colleagues i remember that was about 17 years ago uh, you organized an event at the university of nigeria Osuka, at which uh, some of us were honored so dr chooks or diego Eberem, let's hear from you thank you so much arista or Salado, for very senior jackson Good evening, everyone. I can say we have been <clears throat> technically been coming to the end of this program. I have no doubt in my mind that it has been one huge, exciting outing for the organizers, and of course, a wonderful experience for all participants. Well, I am privileged to have been asked to give this word of thanks, perhaps because I was there at the beginning, and then throughout the planning, and then today. As always, such an event owes its success <clears throat> with special efforts and the sacrifices of people and groups. And uh, I would like to recognize them and thank them very well. So on behalf of the Jacksonites BDS series steering committee, I wish to sincerely thank Professor Ndika Otiono for a wonderful presentation today. At the time he accepted to deliver this lecture, everything was still in the formative stage, but he accepted to deliver it and even joined us in part of the planning, including, of course, developing the publicity materials. And of course, he participated actively in the rehearsals. And today he has done a brilliant work that is so impactful today. Prof, we have heard you very loud and clear, and we are happy about the conclusions you have reached, and that is to say the media cannot be captured, uh, providing some historical and contemporary evidence to show that it's only a matter of time this facade will go. I'm very grateful for you to have done this today, and uh, we, the organizers, we want to thank you. God bless you. Quite a number of uh, uh, German issues have been highlighted by the lecturer. And like I said, we note them in particular, your concerns about the, the role governments are playing. And of course, the fact that uh, the media too, they have a role to play to be quite impartial. Although you said it is going to be a bit uh, problematic. So, we have understood that, and I believe from there, 
the conversations will continue. Thank you so much. Let me also extend our gratitude to Barista Chrisley Osadolo for moderating this event with class. Since his lights started shining at Ahsoka in the 1980s, when he emerged as the all-round best graduating student, that light has continued to shine, and I believe it will continue to be brighter and brighter. So thank you so much, sir, for honoring us with your wealth of experience. To the president, Jackson Ice Worldwide, Professor Pat Tommy, a household name and a driving force in the Jackson Ice alumni movement, we thank you, Prof, for always being there for us, both in the forefront and, of course, at the background. Thank you, sir. And then to our sponsor, Prince Emeka Odo, technical partner, DigiConverge, and media partner, The News Guru. We appreciate you all for what you have done. Now, one person whose role in all this stands out so prominently, yet unannounced, is Professor Chinedu Mbafibo. As a chairperson, she conceived the idea, she conscripted many of us, and together we... Kingsley Osadala, lawyer, veteran journalist, renowned broadcaster, distinguished alumnus of the University of Nigeria, fellow Nigerian Guild of Editors, former editor of The Guardian on Sunday, ex-deputy managing director, Guardian Newspapers, commissioner for information, Edo State, special advisor to the Minister of Information, currently anchor of NTA's influential Good Morning Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with a clapping and standing ovation, please make